Welcome back to This Week. Time now to get the views of our media and political experts, MMA Creative Vice President and Democratic Operative Mike Kopp, and her daily on 1510 WLAC syndicated talk show host, Steve Gill. Welcome. Nice to see you both. President on the air this week talking to the nation, bringing troops home beginning soon, and by a year from now, 33,000 U.S. troops will be brought home. seems like nobody likes the idea of the plan. It's not soon enough. It's not, too, not enough people uh, for right now. It's a start. We talked to Ford Campbell people. Obviously, they are pleased, but again, the timelines is what seems to be the problem. Yeah, I think it's all timing, and it's the fact that you've got the commanding generals and the Secretary of Defense who are saying, we don't like this plan. So his top advisors who do have the experience, do have the credentials, are saying, don't do it this way. I think it's the same thing we've seen with the Libya uh, issue on whether or not to seek congressional approval for the military action, the hostilities in Libya. The lawyers at the White House, the lawyers at the Pentagon are giving the president advice. You have to comply with the law. He's ignoring the advice, and I think that's going to be a problem for him down the line. I think the, the bottom line, though, is he said he was going to do this when he was running mm -hmm. for office, and I think he's just honoring that commitment. And the fact of the matter is his Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, did, in fact, say this was an okay plan. Now, he does have those generals that are opposed to it, but those are the same generals that got us into this thing to begin with. So I don't think it should come as any surprise because this is exactly what he said he was going to do when he ran for the office. The danger, obviously, is you can't pull everybody out immediately. I right. guess the question is, can you accelerate what the president wants to do? Well, you don't want to have that leaving Vietnam, right. helicopters, right. And people hanging off of them on, you know, on the top of the roof. Uh, the problem is you're leaving mainly military combat forces. Mm -hmm. What they're going to pull out first, it appears, are going to be the folks that are building bridges and water stations and those things, which I think the American people are saying, as the president pointed out, okay, let's stop nation building there in terms of the, the, the infrastructure. Do it back let's here. Do it here if we're going to do it anywhere. But that means that the, the less number of troops that are there, the all combat troops there, are still going to be facing a very difficult enemy. And we're withdrawing literally in the middle of the next big war season because summer's when you fight. We're going to be pulling out literally in the middle of a battle. That's dangerous to our troops. The other issue, though, is we are dealing with a budget. And we this war has cost you know over $400 billion. Mm -hmm. And the president has got to deal with the reality of trying to get us eventually to a balanced budget. And one of the things that's got to happen is cuts in defense. Talking yeah, about but, the you're budget. Also, but you're also bombing the snot out of Libya to the tune of billions of dollars, and nobody, I think, sees really kind of what we're gaining from that. We're looking at Yemen doing the same thing. If it's a budget-cutting deal, then, yeah, let's stop getting into the third and fourth war while we're still trying to get out of the... The problem. president talked about Lebanon, Lebanon, Libya in his, in his uh, speech, saying that there are no U.S. troops on the ground. Right. Some in Congress still don't think he should go to them for approval for what's going on there. Well, it is still under a NATO exercise. Right, Remember, we're not right. the only country that's in the middle of that, so it isn't really a U.S. war, per se. And, of course, we see the reports like in the Wall Street Journal where apparently Gaddafi is now realizing that his end may be near and he mm -hmm. may be fleeing Tripoli. So I'm not sure we're, you know, I think at the end of the day this thing is going to have the results we want, which is to get Gaddafi out of there and maybe a democratic you know, democracy in there. You still ought to comply with the law, and these are hostilities. I think it is absolutely ludicrous for the president and his team to argue that these are not hostilities because they're not shooting back when we're firing missiles, when we're killing civilians, plus when we're paying combat pay to airmen, sailors, and marines. We might not have actual soldiers on the ground, but we're paying combat pay to those in the theater. That kind of implies that we're in combat. August 2nd is the magic date for the debt ceiling to be approved, something to happen, or the World's going to end if you listen to some, and maybe it will. Uh, this week, obviously, there was discussions going on. The Republicans and Democrats split. It's not happening yet. Will a deal be made? Will there be some kind of advance to the debt ceiling? I think a deal will be made at some point. But keep in mind, they were telling us a few weeks ago that it was the end of the world if we didn't do something then. I, I think you run into the risk of the, the boy who cried wolf. And, and when we actually do have a wolf in the neighborhood, nobody's going to believe it because they've used the false hysteria a couple of times. I think we will get to a compromise, but I do think... The Republicans are going to have to give in on some of these, on some of the, you know, the whole issue about the tax breaks mm -hmm. for the big oil and big gas companies. I mean, those kind of things, the American people are not satisfied with big oil and big gas companies not putting their fair share into this deal. And Republicans can't continue to ignore that. So that's going to have to be part of the equation. Well, both the sides are going to have to give in some regard. Though. Absolutely. Th there'll be some give. But the problem is big oil that's being painted as the enemy by this administration makes less on a gallon of gasoline than big government. And if we're going to look at trying to reduce the burden and make people pay their fair share, then let's cut the gas taxes because the gasoline companies are making a lot less than the federal government at a can of Talk about the uh, presidential race going on as we see the GOP beginning to field their field. Rick Perry looks like he's going to get in. The governor of Texas, uh, he's going to get a lot of attention. 
Yeah, and again, I think you're seeing a guy that's bringing some energy and some passion. You know, you've still got, I think, Mitt Romney, who's still the front runner mm -hmm. with the money, with the organization, but he's not evoking the kind of passion that people are wanting to see. You've got that being filled by Herman Cain. You've got that with Michelle Bachman. You know, the thing that Mitt Romney has to like, though, is the more people that get in, the more it divvies up the non-Romney vote, the better of it is for Conservative him. folks, the Tea Party folks like Rick Perry. He's, and he's got a lot to look at. And again, you look at, at the pitch he's able to make of we created jobs in Texas. We created more jobs in Texas than the rest of the country combined by doing the exact opposite of what the Obamanomic plan has been for the country. My plan will work for America, and you ought to pick it. Democrats will say this guy used to be a Democrat, supported Al Gore. Now he's exactly. George Bush light. Right, and you got Mitt Romney, who at one point you know, basically created the national health care model that the Obama administration is mirroring. Republicans have a, a real tough time right now. They should be behind a single candidate by now, and they're not. And they're split and they're all over the place and it, it, it's you know going to be a problem for the Republicans. It looks Democrats like the Democrats. Were split, <laughs> Democrats were split between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and they ended up winning last time. I'd also say that I think the good thing about the, the Mitt Romney move on the issue, he was wrong, now he's right. Uh, you've got Rick Perry, he was wrong, now he's right. So I think what you're seeing with the Republicans is they've tried the Democrat way, they've rejected it, and that's going to be a pretty strong pitch next Here year. in Tennessee this week, uh, UT Board of Trustees agreed to a 12% tuition increase. Tuition has gone up yearly in this state while state funding has been cut. In the past 10 years, tuition has doubled in this state. We can't keep continuing this way. What's the solution? Our schools going to have to be consolidated. Cuts going to have to be made. They can't keep continuing to balance their books on the backs of parents and students. Well, we talk a lot about the rising cost of health care in this country. Academic costs, college education costs are rising at a much faster mm -hmm. percentage and pace. And I think people need to start looking at how colleges and universities work. You've got professors that work part-time at best who get paid exorbitant salaries. You've got cost for classrooms that are empty most of the day, the bricks and mortar, overextended and underused. And I think, frankly, we need to look at this whole lottery scholarship business in Tennessee. When lottery scholarships were put in place, they were supposed to cover tuition. Now it's covering about three or $4,000 at the University of Tennessee at MTSU, and the tuition cost is about 8000 mm -hmm. We need to take a solid look at what we're spending that lottery money on that isn't putting it into tuition. Academia has got to embrace technology. Technology is where we're going to find those cost savings, and until they do that, we're going to end up with the same model. And you don't want to regrudge uh, faculty and staff pay raises, but you can't continue to give pay raises and then raise tuition by 10, 12 percent. Parents are going to look at this and go, this just isn't right. I haven't gotten a raise in the last five years. Right. It's a tough call. It is a tough call, but again, we, you know, we've got to think about how we teach differently. We've got to think about getting away from the bricks and mortar and, and a lot of the old models that maybe worked 50 years ago, but technology will allow us to bring education into the homes, into the classrooms, into these community colleges, and until we academia starts to embrace that, we're going to end up with these same, the same model over and over again. Senator Alexander this week talked about the 30 years of Nissan being in Tennessee and the impact it has had when he was governor. Of course, he was instrumental in bringing it here. The leaf beginning to be produced next year. The battery is going to be produced for the electric car. This really is a model in Tennessee that we haven't seen anything quite like this. Well, and, and the advantage is it not only brought a new industry to Tennessee in terms of the automotive industry that's expanded really throughout the South. You've now got Volkswagen mm -hmm. down in Chattanooga. You've got Toyotas. You've got, you've got all sorts of cars being made throughout the South. Nissan really kind of opened the door here in Tennessee. And then you get all those secondary businesses as well that have to serve those major automotive groups. That's the best kind of uh, economic development because you not only get the person who comes, get all the people who have to come with them, and you don't have to pay anything for This that. gives young people an opportunity to become involved in the manufacturing sector because of this new technology, and that's what we need to do to save the manufacturing sector. My cop, Steve Gill, appreciate your time and your insight. Stay with us. This week continues in a moment.